evening session with our keynote present, present, presentation, and I'll introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Wafa Bihar, in a minute. But um, just to welcome you all once again to the session, to those of you who have just arrived, to uh, introduce very briefly the uh, conference and, and give, some, give some thanks to some of the people who have organized the conference. Uh, first of all, to the Martin D. Siegel Theatre Centre, to the PhD program in Theatre and Performance, both based in the Graduate Centre, and to our colleagues from the American University of Beirut. Uh, we are presenting this conference on the Arabic dramaturgies as part of an exchange uh, that was established as a memorandum of understanding between uh, our president, President Chase Robinson, and the president of the American University of Beirut, um, Faldo Kaori, uh, my Arabic is not very fluent as you can tell. <laughs> um, and, um, um, and it gives me great pleasure just before we uh, hear our keynote tonight to invite President Robinson, who is crucial in establishing this uh, exchange between the two universities, to make some welcoming comments. And uh, he is an Arabist, so he'll be able to pronounce it. <laughs> thank you very much, Chess. which Professor Eckersall announced bear fruit in such a powerful way. Um, this is the first of several, um, <coughs> several expressions of that partnership. For instance, there are colleagues in the sciences who have begun to work together, and there are plans in that sector as well. Um, but this is the very, very first manifestation of the goodwill that we gave um, as a more contractual in the MOU that Peter mentioned. It's wonderful to invite back, but welcome to New York. Um, great to have two visitors from the group, great to have international visitors. Um, great to make the acquaintance of I would like nothing more than to stay, but the mm. motif of my responsibilities, I have to run to another event, which I can guarantee you will be much less interesting than this. <laughs> uh, it is because of the, the terrific um, set of colleagues we have in the theater, in the Siegel Center, that we have the tradition that we have. And as I said a moment ago, it's um, uh, uh, part of the 
service institutions, really exceptional commitment to the humanities, to the performing arts, to those expressions of, of, of our common humanity, if I may, editorialize a little bit. Professor Carlson, is there no more inspiring figures in our field? Professor Carlson. Um, that this event is taking place and the symposium is taking place. So I wish you all the best. Uh, I, I envy you all. Um, and I will be, I'll, keeping, I'll be keeping an eye on you in DC, making sure that all goes well. Um, it does feel a little bit like a, a parent whose child leaves for college or something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Siegel Center side, of course, we have uh, Professor Frank Henschko, who's the Executive Director. <laughs> and working on this event as a, as a cultural producer and dramaturg is Salma Zondi. <laughs> um, I'd like to acknowledge our colleagues from the Amer uh, American University in Beirut, uh, Professor Robert Myers. And Professor Salma Asaf. Both of you have travelled a long way to be here, and uh, uh, I'm going to Beirut in two weeks' time with a colleague from philosophy and also Frank uh, to uh, uh, return our visit to make a delegation there. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Professor Marvin Carlson, also from the PhD. Program. <laughs> We also have Professor Jean Graham Jones, who is a professor <laughs> our PhD program here. So, um, this is a topic about uh, uh, trying to think about dramaturgy in relation to the history, culture, and practice of Arabic theatre. It's uh, a field that I don't have any particular expertise in myself, so it's very fascinating to me, although. I am very interested in dramaturgy as, a, as a, a, a way of conducting research and also a way of conducting practice. So uh, we've worked a lot on dramaturgical theory and practice in our program. Uh, and uh, this event is one of the manifestations of that. So uh, this afternoon we had several papers, I think, that introduced us to various perspectives on dramaturgy uh, how to make theatre, how to make theatre in sites of occupation, how to make performance in sites where uh, particular bodies are expected to be invisible uh, and want to become more visible, uh, how to make performance as a form of cultural, political, social activism. Uh, and all of those things are dramaturgical questions because broadly they, they're about relating uh, a set of ideas, a set of perspectives, a set of political possibilities to uh, creative, artistic, and imaginative outcomes. And dramaturgy describes that bridge, how uh, something from an idea or a politics or a place in the world, an experience of the world, finds its representation in artistic practice. So uh, I very much would welcome all of you who've come, many of you have come from far away to present papers uh, both today and tomorrow. And um, as a way of framing our conversation, it's uh, uh, actually a great honor to introduce our keynote tonight. Um, well, I, I've not met you until today, but I know your work very well because uh, prior to coming to the Graduate Center, I was uh, 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 working at the University of Melbourne where I had a very talented uh, PhD student who about 10 years ago discovered your work. And, and actually, I don't know if you know this, but Half of her dissertation is about your work. Um, uh, uh, so I've, um, through uh, this, this actual connection, I've, I've, I've been introduced to a, a remarkable uh, practice, uh, uh, a practice that is embodied, that is uh, 
dramaturgical in, in, in the sense that it, it, it is about a certain kind of clarity of, of perspective and a certain kind of politics. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you tonight and to have you uh, present the keynote in framing our inquiry. So uh, just as a more formal introduction, I'll just uh, read you a little bit of um, Lafa uh, uh, um, uh resume. So internationally acclaimed Iraqi-American artist Wafa Bilal will discuss select projects from his extensive body of work, including Domestic Tension, aka show, uh, Shoot an Iraqi, Virtual Jihadi, and, third, and the third Bilal work lends technology and performance <coughs> to pose questions <coughs> about geopolitical and personal realities with an emphasis on dynamic encounters and relational antagonisms. Uh, Wafa is a working art artist. He's also a professor at the New York University. Uh, teaching in, I think, the artistic program there, uh, and uh, a very widely uh, recognized and international artist of, of standing. So, welcome to the Graduate Center and welcome to this conference. And Thank you so much. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much uh, for the invite. I want to thank Frank uh, and the Graduate Center for uh, extending the invitation to be uh, here uh, today. And I wanted to tell our visitors from uh, Beirut and the Southern, and as we say from Iraq and Iraq, Stolk. <laughs> um, I have to be honest with you, I am not an expert in theater. So, I'm not an expert in theater. However, I know what it means and how it functions in terms of engagement. It is about storytelling, but in a creative way. I remember our days in Iraq, and <coughs> I'm not young, but I grew up in a time when we did not have television. And it was all about storytelling. I think the experiences we have in our life come from our ancestors. And then, of course, media come and ruin everything. <laughs> it ruined that center state, which is the grandmother, the player, and the actor, and the director, and the storyteller. It ruined that. I grew up in Iraq in Enter Saddam's regime in the 80s and 90s. As a young child, I grew up in Nazar. Uh, it was hard for us. Uh, we <coughs> grew up idolizing the regime because when we opened our eyes, we saw the regime as a way to propel the society forward any things we are not happy with in that society. Later on, we discovered the routine was really not what it is. It was all about oppression. It was all about control. Nothing to do. So we revolt. I was a student studying geology in the last year in 1990, when Saddam, when Saddam invaded <laughs> Kuwait. And I was one of these college kids who protested the invasion. And then, as a result, I was on the run, ended up in a refugee camp for two years in Saudi Arabia. And than the United States. And through all these years, one thing that kept my sanity and one thing I 
always embrace it is the way I express myself it is art later on the medium <coughs> evolved but we at the essence of it it is about engagement we grew up in a very politically charged world and I remember my first days in, at the University of New Mexico as a student, people told me, you make political art. And I didn't understand what that means. <laughs> I thought all art is political. So we evolved, I evolved, as my education and my understanding evolved with it as well. I think I came from a zone I call a conflict zone. And now, when I write, I exist in the comfort zone of the United States. And unfortunately, <coughs> these two zones have been engaged in world politics as long as I remember. At the beginning of my work, I was making political art as a statement, imposing on my viewers in the comfort zone, regardless of what they know, what they don't know. And most, I have to say, of them did not know what is happening back in the comfort zone. They did not know the complicity of the government of the United States and the crime that this government is involved in. When I made the statement to us, I find myself in a very difficult situation. I'm alienating the very people I'm trying to engage. Then, as things happen in our life totally unexpected, There are moments, I refer them as cornerstones of our life, that have changed the trajectory of our course, our life. One of these moments took place in 2004, when I was teaching at the Art Institute of Chicago. That is one year after the invasion of Iraq. The news was my brother Haji was killed by a drone attack on our hometown of Cuba. An American drone attack. Three years passed by. I did not know what to do and how to communicate my loss and my family loss to the people I exist with. Not until 2000 when I was watching an American soldier directing drones, dropping weapons on Iraqi with absolutely no psychological or physical connection to the target. And I remember I am already having a show scheduled at Flat Fire in Chicago. I immediately called my gallerist, Susan Aranko, and I said, I have an idea I wanted to do. It is completely different than the proposed show. I said, honey, what is the idea? I told her. Simply, the idea is to move my living space, my living room, into the gallery. Constructing a website, and the website could be <coughs> stripped of any political rhetoric about Iraq. And <coughs> Providing navigation buttons to
that could shoot at me 24 hours for the entire confinement of my time, which was 31 days. Visitors were able to come and talk to me during these 30 days, sit with me to witness the very miniature conflict zone within the comfort zone of the United States. The results were completely unexpected. I was shot at 70,000 times. 126 countries were engaged in the shooting, and with 80 million hits on the website, but I think the most amazing thing happened is the amount of the dialogue that took place in the chat room of the project. In it, in this project, I was able to construct a live theater to be the solo actor and performer in the room. I offer my body in order to engage other bodies regardless of their politics. Things were great. Technology worked. Team I put together uh, always were there until day 10 when the Chicago Tribune had the project on the front page. And then everything so many people coming to the website, interacting with each other, shooting. And I thought it is the end of the project. When the project ceased to work, I see <coughs> to work as well. Here is a video of how I was mentally on that day. I think 
once we witness losses in our life, uh, we tend to block that. We tend to build an emotional wall to protect us from acknowledging it. And I think only when I was in the physical and psychological um, uh, stressful situation, I was able for the first time ever to acknowledge my loss. Um, many people participated, including and not surprising hackers, which they love to hack the gun, turn it to an automatic, let it shoot on its own, or people from the left who love to hack the gun, turn it to the left, keep it to the left, preventing people from uh, shooting me. That was expected. And day 14 was one of these days. I really did not know what happened, why there are so many people uh, were shooting. Apparently, uh, the, the project was so popular that is people on uh, a, a website called dig.com decide to come all together and shoot. On that day alone, I was shot 20,000 times. And here is a quick video from, from <coughs> that day. Okay, everybody, it's day 14. This is being insane because uh, what happened is I was hit uh, .com and the place has been completely bombarded non-stop for the last two, three hours. And you could see it's absolutely the trap so much. I mean, to the point, you cannot, not a second. I cannot even, um, I cannot even keep a trap. I keep, keep falling, falling the pot here. Dig.com, this is really disturbing. This is nonstop. I cannot keep track of this. I cannot film these people fast enough uh, to, to keep with the demand. Okay, I'll let you go because I think uh, I cannot do the camera and cannot do the display. So uh, I'll just uh, have to run bet uh, back and forth. Uh, see, I have to run back and forth between, um, and, uh, between, <coughs> see, see, now I'm, I'm taking hit, I'm taking hit for them. See, I mean, just, it's, it's absolutely non non stop, and this is so disturbing right now. Okay, okay, I I'm gonna go in a in a in a safer place. Uh, very very disturbing, but uh, I guess I I set up the situation. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> uh, I cannot give up right now, and I won't give up. Uh, But I guess sometimes in the process of making things come together, all they fall apart. When they fall apart, we want them to fall apart in a fantastic way. When they succeed, we want them to succeed. And, and, and fortunately, fortunately, others succeed to reach objective. And you can see from the next video, I change as the product reach its goal, and I think one of the most important thing to me as an artist, as an Iraqi, as an American, it was the project reach the right people, <coughs> they interact with it the right way, they work to each other, and art. I was once again assured the power of art and the power of engagement to achieve an object. shots right now. It's uh, very busy right here and I think, uh, I don't know why the traffic all of a sudden 
but it might have to do with the, the mass day of shooting. But I am going to extend this to one more day. So instead of ending on day three, I am going to end it tomorrow, which is 31 days. This is dedicated, the extra day is dedicated to the people who doubt it, I will go through with us. So, to the supporter, thank you very much. You've been great uh, in, in this interview. It has been very hard to me, ups and downs, united people, divided people, but that's what art supposed to do. It's supposed to inform, it's supposed to agitate and it's supposed to be part of life so thanks everybody for your great support and uh, one more thing I would uh, uh, I have no resentment uh, to the people who shot uh, it's an encounter it's not a didactic piece so it's an open narrative one we can all impose our, our own narrative on it so uh, to to end the uh, I am in great spirits. Uh, the energy is great. There is a, of course, there is a mental and physical aspect, uh, but uh, that I can deal with that after five o'clock tomorrow. I hope to see some of you when I walk out of the gallery. Otherwise, I would love to see everybody on the 16th of June when uh, we take this place down. So either I see you tomorrow or I will see you on the 16th. Uh, thank you again, and it has been a great journey. Bye for now. Uh, so as, as, as I mentioned, it really, the project gave me clarity of purpose, and uh, it gave me an opportunity to see, to say to myself, why did it work? Then I start um, uh, taking notes down and um, uh, see what worked and what did not work. And I come up with very simple few ideas, and I refer them as a strategy of engagement. First, knowing my person, I exist, as I said earlier, in simultaneous <coughs> in these two zones. One is physical, and the other one is mental. By living in the comfort zone, I uh, saw my art being rejected and uh, alienating people if it was straight on a hammer hitting people on their head. Then I start employing very simple tactic, which is aesthetic pleasure versus aesthetic pain. The aesthetic pleasure here is simply us. Uh, the project at the face value, it is not too serious. I mean, who wouldn't like to shoot a guy uh, was trapped in um, a room over the internet with your phone. Everybody loved it. It, it, it became the water cooler uh, talk, right? And, and you can see from this project and the next other project as well, at the face value, it is very playful. Then the aesthetic pain, what is the meaning, the objective of the project, delivers slowly when the people engage with Virtual platform, physical platform, that is very simple. That is utilizing the power of the internet by allowing people to come and interact. No longer their interaction is limited to a physical place, which is the gallery or the museum. Now I could be in their homes, I could be in their offices, talking allowing them to talk so my role as an artist become a trigger for a platform rather than somebody who imposed on them. The body has its own language. I think you guys know this. If you are in the theater business, the body activates other bodies in front of them. That is why I think theater is one of the most powerful um, uh, art of form we could engage uh, with and it could affect us. I realized that because I saw that you might were not empathetic to my cause then, but they become empathetic to my body in me. And then, of course, all these ideas lead to one thing, which I call them, uh, which I call it, it's an encounter, uh, which is a platform in which all possible in the state are unknown. What does that mean? Simply coming from computer programming. It means I would not write the script entirely. I would leave a lot of chances to 
my viewer give them uh, a very important role to assume the very narrative they are writing. Once they write part of the narrative, they invest in it. It becomes their own, and then they keep <coughs> repeating it, which was that's what exactly happened during domestic tension shoot anyway. <coughs> now, the project was a big hit. I start uh, receiving other invitations uh, from people to do other projects, to engage communities. And it's always, now when he, he is an Iraqi, he is Muslim, we wanted to bring him to do something that he did before. And I said, sure, I will do that. The first one <laughs> came from Mentalvo Art Center in Saratoga when was like come engage our community and I said fine. All what I gonna do is this simple uh, project. I want always people to communicate to other people. This way I propose building a farmhouse, an Iraqi style farmhouse, and equipped it with technology for people around the center to come and live there for a day or two. Um, and talk to Iraqis back home. And the center and the people around it step by in a great way. Within one month, we build a complete house. We use the, uh, the material from the ground itself, the water from the ground. And by day 30th, we got a beautiful house, and of course, mm -hmm. with, with, the, with the internet connected to it. Here is what people around the center didn't know. On that opening night, on that opening night, I wanted to blow up the house. <laughs> and I agreed with the center, but then in the last minute, they said, no. I said, why not? They said, well, well, well it's going to alienate our audience. I said, what? Uh, this is what all about. It's about you have you sweat and you need to build a house and then in a matter of second it all disappear. They said no. And I said, wait, wait, what kind of democracy it does not let you blow up your own house? You should come to Iraq. This way you can blow up your neighbor house if you don't like them. Of course, they didn't get the joke, you know. So, I left it behind, went on to another project. This time, it was from an educational institution, Rensselaer Biotechnical Institute, and they proposed the same thing. Come here for a few weeks, engage our classes, and at that time, it was 2008, I believe. It was so difficult in terms of being um, uh, being Arab, being an Arab, and being Iraqi, and it was all talk about waterboarding. What the military, what the CIA are doing to the subject, they call them the subject they capture in the Middle East around the world. A waterboarding is, is a torture method invented by the Spaniard, and then the American um, uh, army adopted to uh, impose it on the soldier to, con to, um, to force them to confess to crime they probably never committed. And I, as an artist, as an activist, as an Arab, wanted to know if this is a torture method, because the Pentagon said this is not a torture method, it's not drama, it's simulated drama. So I thought I set up myself to uh, figure out is it or is it not. So, but, but I really didn't want it to say, okay, I'm not going to hold the sign at the intersection and say, this is torture, it's not good, it's going to kill people. So it's like, well, let's play. And I, I launched a website called Dot or Iraq. <laughs> a lot of people devote for 30 days to who are they going to water for at the end of the day, at the end of the 30 days. So many people got mad at me. They thought, I get a water for the dog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, any Peter Mentor hair? Any Peter Mentor hair? <laughs> Seriously, they were really serious about it. And I was kicked out of campus. And I remember I picked up the phone and I said, have you heard about this awful things this artist is doing, trying to water for the dog? They said, yes, we do. I said, great. Um, uh, can I ask questions? They said, yeah, ask questions. Just like, I said, is there a speed of 40 <laughs> And of course, they hang up on me. Regardless, 
I lost the dog, we moved on, still wanted to know if water borden is similar to drawn or drawn. Then I had no choice but to subject myself into this torture method. With the help of two friends who never <coughs> would waterboard anybody, we ran from the media, we find a basement, and they waterboard it. which also received a lot of media attention and outcry from the right. Uh, virtual Jihadi um, uh, came uh, inspired by a video game released by Al-Qaeda in 2005 under the name of the game called The Night of Bush Capture, which is, I doubt it, uh, that Al-Qaeda know what the meaning of the title is. So, and I really thought it was like, maybe they start getting into the porn business, right? But apparently, they were not even aware of what that, what that title even means, you know? So I thought, OK, I wanted to know, how did they make this game? So I went on to investigate. And apparently, the game is not even a part of the game. It was an American game released in 2003 by Jesse Petrola to go and shoot Iraqis, which all of them have Saddam face and speak non-Arabic, nonsense Arabic when you shoot at them. Mm -hmm. And even just like the retro, uh, the, the vending machine called Camel Cola, not a Coca-Cola. So uh, what Al-Qaeda did, they went on to change the skin from, uh, from Camel Cola to Pepsi, from Saddam face to Bush's face, from um, uh, an Iraqi soldier to an American soldier, and then it was an outcry. cry. And I thought, a simple change of skin outraged people in the comfort zone. I got to do something with it to address multiple issues. So I developed the objective. The objective were very simple. Okay. I wanted the game to be a mirror exposing hypocrisy and racism. Uh, re reversing the role of hunter and hunted, addressing the issue of suicide bombers, <coughs> and then involving people who may not be willing to engage in the dialogue. Simply, I went on to insert my own narrative. As an Iraqi, living in Chicago, teaching, happy, one day I get the news, oh, my brother get killed, and then my father died after two months, after that, I go into rage and become a virtual suicide bomber. I went on to hack the game and insert my avatar. Uh, this is after Assassin's Creed, if you know any games. And it became like a medieval warrior with a suicide belt. It didn't really make any sense. 
So I agree with the 3D, 3D um, artist. I said, you did a terrible job in my avatar. Ma make my face good. They did. Because I was really happy with this. <laughs> And I inserted my avatar to go on a mission. You send, you send me on a mission to assassinate President Bush.
is putting, uh, is organizing a protest and using very inflammatory language. Mr. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. By Al? The law? No, I, A, I have not seen the game. B, I only know about you from what I've read in the paper and I've seen on TV. I, that should be nothing but terrorism. It's so far, in my view, from art. It's just, it, it's, it's terrorism. I've been told that Muslims, all Muslims, are liars. And secondly, that all mosques should be closed. You're going down. You and your right are going down. Uh, I think we went out of our way not to kill Iraqis. I think they're probably doing more killing than each other at this point. But I, I think he's just a terrorist in, in sheep's clothing. We're trying to get rid of these kind of real spots. All that Century, the government this time shut it down. And they said, has nothing to do with politics, just the doors to the gallery were 29 inches, <coughs> not 30 inches, that's it. <laughs> so people did not buy, of course, that argument. The beauty of this, it angered them, it allowed them to have a real dialogue, it got people outside, and it got them to the point to protest in front of the city hall for many days until they forced the government not only to open the door, but to compensate their, uh, to fix the door of the of the guy. Free speech! Free speech! Video game exhibit, first family on the off campus, and then at a Troy Art Center led to a protest. An Iraqi refugee, imprisoned in the park of the Saddam Hussein, finally makes his way to the United States, learns English, gets a college degree, becomes an art professor, does an art project so important that he's the Chicago of the year last year, and gets invited to Troy, New York, thinking it was a great honor. <coughs>
leaves the documentary work. Then I wanted to do another account. I wanted to build another stage where people are welcome to acknowledge the losses. So I went into the research mode again, where I looked at the Iraqi map, Iraq map. Then I went on to figure out, according to the information I had, where every Iraqi died according to the map. And after that, I took all the information and I translated that every Iraqi death equal a dot. I went on to translate that into my own body physically by first <coughs> doing a tattoo with a regular ink on my back. Later on, in a 24 hours performance, I allowed two tattoo artists to allocate these dots. At the same time, I allowed people to come and pick up a stack of papers, one for Iraqis lost, and the other one for American soldiers lost, to read the name aloud. And I thought, it's a symbolic gesture. By reading the name, we acknowledge the loss. One thing I wanted to um, directly illustrate the idea of visible invisible, when I asked the tattoo artist to allocate these dots, I asked them to use invisible dot, which is using an ink that cannot be seen unless you are, I am, under I mean, 80 
800,000 images, a lot of them, nothing, right? Uh, it's just really banal images from dark, not at night, while I'm sleeping, into uh, the walks I take in New York City, people close by, people turning their head away, people saying, seriously, you have a camera in the back of your head? Right? But hey, some people were happy to be on the camera. <laughs> it was voyeuristic, which is expected. Like every camera we have on the street and the institutions as well. It did <coughs> capture some moment. moments. But the most important thing I found out about that project after a while, it is the beauty of being connected to others. It is worldwide connectivity that allowed us to voice our opinion, something that never existed before. If it is abuse, which it is like every system, at least we have this idea of if I am wherever I am, I could reach it to tell them what has happened. And 800,000 images were shared publicly, including to apparently every uh, Arab or Muslim is being watched by three uh, FBI guys all the time. It was shared with them, <laughs> saying, hey, this is really nothing. You see, you're wasting your time of watching me. So I do something better. <laughs> I wanted to get my talk now in talking about poetic gesture in art. It is not a secret to crowd like you. The performance takes so much energy from your body, your mind. And I wanted to balance that. That balance comes really from something completely unplanned. And one of these projects I went from 2003 to 2000. 14 called the Ashes Sea. <coughs> the Ashes series, um, it was a symbol of, I was disturbed by the images coming from back home from 2003 on, about the places I visited as a child, places I know of it with, whether there are uh, uh, public institution, homes. So for me, it was 2003, I couldn't go home. I wanted to connect to uh, back home, and I wanted to slow the viewer in, the, in, in my own zone down to look at these images as not images of another war and they don't register anymore and I got to move. So it was slowing down um, uh, uh, the, the process <coughs> of looking. And I find myself building these images in many schools and literally inserting the human aura into these images by spraying 21 gram of a human ashes in these images before I take the shot. I think when we come from troubling places and having a hard time spending there, sometimes this <coughs> trauma is stayed with us. And I find one way to minimize its effect is to look into the humor of it. And so when I ask by, um, uh, to do something for the armory here in New York, I went back to look remembering things. One of these things it was when Saddam was alive, the Ba'ath party proposed this 
kind of a crazy idea of uh, building a giant sculpture of him and go play it in gold, release it above Iraq to be secret, uh, geosynchronized above Iraq. So when Iraqis look, there is a gold star shining on them forever. Right? <laughs> they didn't. They didn't had a chance to do it. And I thought, okay, good. How? What if I do that project? Right? It wouldn't be. Wouldn't be good to let the power go and minimize the the psychological effect of that dictator on us. So I solicited um, veterans of the Iraq War to come and help me to realize that project. We produce very nice bust. We produce a dark hole of candle holders, you know, just like if it's visible and it's almost there, we don't even think about it as a dictator. It becomes an object, it becomes a banal. And then the book ends, right? right you know. and, 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 and then that's the bus is gonna, uh, was prepared to go to the space to actually be geosynchronized above your right. And recently somebody said, why don't you geosynchronize it above Texas? <laughs> That's really a good idea. Maybe we could do that. But I didn't get a chance to do it. And I heard recently somebody um, sent a Tesla uh, just like into the space. I don't know if you guys know this project or not. Um, so I'm thinking about going into uh, uh, Musk and say, can we collaborate on this project? It might be nice <laughs> than having a car in the space. It could be just like a, a great dictator in this place. <laughs> um, quickly, um, uh, going into what have we contributed from our own culture into the rest. Um, and this project is called, I think I could tell, addressing the issues of the post-traumatic stress disorder that is I, as an Iraqi American soldier, and so many people suffer from. And when I was looking into methods of healing, I come across very interesting one. Um, uh, it's called chromolite. And it is invented by Ibn Sina in the 13th century. And it is healing with colors. And there are seven colors he indicated. Each color have a different effect, e even on the mind and on the body. And apparently you have to immerse yourself to see what color that is going to uh, react to your body, to your mind, in order to heal what you suffer from. And apparently a lot of people using that method of. So what I did with this installation, extremely simple. I staged another um, uh, uh, place, another encounter, where people simply uh, encounter this giant threatening war. And then they could, when, when they move beyond that wall, they are uh, faced with a known person, which he was uh, an American veteran. Um, and I got to know him very well. And I start offering the place to the veterans um, to, to witness or to heal from uh, what they are suffering from. <coughs> One of the last projects I want to um, share with you before there is a bonus to it as, as, as well. So um, I hope you like the bonus so after this project. 168 uh, uh, hours and one minute. It was 2010. Uh, and it was a curator from Canada asking me if I wanted to do a project about the loss of culture in Iraq, specifically books. And I thought, this is, this is very appealing. It took me six years thinking about how to stage it, what the shape of it. In it, I come across so many things have been destroyed in Iraq. One thing that stopped me in my track, it was the College of Fine Art Library in Baghdad. 70,000 titles were burned to the ground during the invasion. And I sketched um, an installation <coughs> for it, for people to interact. But in the last minute, literally a month before the show, 
I call the curator and I say, I change my mind. And I have a better idea. I wanted the idea to be participatory in nature, and I want it to be rewarded for people who interact with it. And I said, this is the title. And she said, what the title is? I said, I recall um, an anecdote from childhood that is, when the Mongolian invaded Baghdad, in order for them to cross the river, they took the entire um, holding of the libraries in Baghdad, including Beit al which was the largest library at the time. They built a bridge out of that, over the Tigris River. So, and the story goes that is the river ran the blue for seven days, washing the ink and the knowledge of those books. Seven days, equal to 168 hours. I added a minute because I wanted to reverse the course of destruction. Iraqis are not new to it. They rebuild because it's their home. And in that book, I stayed nothing but empty white books, completely no content in them. Just like after the seven days being washed in the river, <coughs> and the exchange take place, took place, where a viewer walk in for all online, take a white book and donate a book from the list generated by the faculty and the student of the College of Fine Art. And it was, and it's still, very rewarding project to see people interact with it. Given to me the most important thing, it's not the book itself, but this idea of the hope, the future of Iraq, the idea of the rest of the world is not leaving Iraq behind or forgetting about it after what it has been. And I'm very happy we deliver our first shipment of about 1,700 books, and many of them come to still keep going. More information of that on <coughs> my website. <coughs> then we wanted to find build a place because the library structurally built, but nothing has been no remodeled. So we send funding to the interior design of the school to rebuild a, a reading room on their own design with the faculty there. I wanted to finish, but I wanted to share one thing with you in the last um, minutes of my presentation. Humor is a big part of our life. Um, and I think sometimes in the name of atrocity, uh, I remember days in 1991 when B-52 bombed Nazareth. I remember sitting with, the, with my families and they are making jokes. I, I, I was part of that industry because without a humor, you would lose your mind. Just like can to minimize the effect of the dictator by looking up and down, by making fun of it. But, and humor, <coughs> specifically stand <coughs> comedy, have this ability to decode hard politics into banal, to make it accessible, to, to hold that mirror in front of our faces to look at that world. And that's what artists are mirror reflecting a social condition. One month, and no only before Trump got elected, we, uh, actually after, we initiated this called Enrique. That's how we say America back home. And in it, it's a state, it's a live one. 
It is everybody welcome to it. And we invite Middle Eastern <coughs> comedians, people who are disfranchised once a month to come to the stage and share it with the community, share the laughter, but also creating the space of community, giving strength to each other. <laughs> Um, so my my uh, my parents are Christian. They're Christian Arab, and so in our home for breakfast we were fed uh, Jewish conspiracy theories, <laughs> and then for lunch we had like a really healthy dose of Islamophobic horror stories. <laughs> like, do you guys remember? All of you, most of you are young, but do you remember in the 80s you you had this drug commercial that this is your brain on drugs? Like we were told this is your life on Islam, <laughs> and this is why they give us white names. Like that's. A lot of people ask me if my real name is Fatima or Khadija. But it's not, it's really Susie. <laughs> and the worst part is sometimes they can't pronounce these names. Like my favorite name that they picture is Victoria. My aunt's name is Victoria. There is no V in Arabic, there's only an F. So good luck keeping Muslim boys away when you call your daughter Factoria. <laughs> So, uh, it worked with Factoria though, she married, she married a Christian guy. <laughs> so basically to summarize, when a Christian Arab girl falls in love with a Muslim, she is either disowned, or her mother gets a heart attack, or somebody kills her in an honor killing. <coughs> so you guys can imagine how scared I was when I fell in love with a Pakistani. It wasn't easy, and I'm actually writing a book about my experience. And it's titled, I married a Muslim and no one died. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. And I'll be very happy to take any questions. There are a lot of things I captured in my uh, book, which was released a few years ago. Uh, so if you're, um, you could grab um, uh, a copy of it. It makes a great read, a great gift as, as well. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Uh, Any questions? Yes, um, we have about a couple of minutes for questions. Five minutes? Five OK, minutes. five minutes. So, um, there's a microphone. Yep. Yep. I know you guys are probably anxious to get to your cocktail drinks. <laughs> I hope, where is your friend? I hope you have cocktails for them. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Shot, yeah. the shot for your eyes. Thank you, thanks for your presentation. Um, just a point of clarification. You said you were in a refugee camp for two years? Yes. How old were you? Okay, now, can I ask you how old are you? I'm 48. I'm 52. Okay, I left Iraq in uh, 91 at age uh, 25, spent two years in a refugee camp until I was 27. I come to United States. Uh, now it's almost half life in the United States and half life in Iraq. And follow up your experience in the refugee camp as far as an impact on your um, imagination and creativity as well, you know, I guess the question is how did that impact your life as an artist? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I have to say even, it is hard to think about these things because uh, many of us were confined into one mile by one mile. Um, barbed wires for many, many years. Uh, but you know, <coughs> it's like, it really depends on you. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm one of these optimistic people. And when I landed in, 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 in the refugee camp, again, I, 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 went, I refer back to art. How is it I could survive this? And I remember the days when, when we did, I didn't even have any uh, materials for artwork, and it was instant coffee and our hair, we make it a breast of that. 
just to keep us alive, because I think that's what art is. Uh, but <coughs> it also it reminds me of how precious life is and how much we take it for granted. Imagine I was in Baghdad, living there, very busy city, a lively city, and all of a sudden I'm in a camp with nothing. My life disappeared. So once I left the camp, I thought of, I just been given a second chance of life. And I used it. I remember day one arriving to Albuquerque, New Mexico. I walked to the nearest university and I said, I want to be a student here. And they said, well, you first you have to go and learn English and then come back. Mm -hmm. And I did. You know. So but, uh, sometimes, really, we end up in situations we never expected. But how can we make the best out of that? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that's the lesson I learned from our future. Mm -hmm. We're good, Frank? No, one more. more and then one more question. Yeah. invited the veterans to be part of the dialogue. And I think with that, um, the, uh, the great thing about being here, it is, and um, it's not what we think about it, it's very uncentralized um, society. <coughs> and there are so many people who would reject you, and so many people who would accept what you say. And I, with every project, I have to determine who are my peers, right? When I wanted to raise awareness about <coughs> video games, about the rhetoric in video games, about um, the dis discrimination, I agitated people. When I wanted to speak about what they go through, I invited them to be part of the dialogue. So really every project, I mean, I, am, I have the privilege as a performer, performance art, artist, um, art, to think, 
to suspend these thoughts until they mature. <coughs> and once that thought, that <coughs> project, is mature, which is the right state at the right time, it is take the central state. What happened, honestly, I had no idea after that. Umbar project failed miserably, but <coughs> I did the best I could do to make them succeed. And sometimes there is nothing coming back. We work, really we, as a performer, we love the idea of the echo sound coming back to us because it assures us, it's not just, just I'm, I'm thinking not of our voice, the reaction from the audience is very important because it assures us we are communicating our, what we say is effective, is getting into that. And to me, the failure of any project when it falls on a death when nobody hears it and no reaction. Can I ask something? Yeah. One last. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, I kind of figured out how this might work, you have to talk like right into it. <laughs> um, uh, this project that you did in Chicago, shooting in Iraqi, and you said that you had in, uh, a dialogue like, space underneath it. I feel, I feel as somebody who grew up without the internet and then when the internet arrived, we were so excited like this was going to fix humanity and all we needed was a chance to talk to each other and see each other and it would be okay. Like, I feel so disillusioned, I feel it's a failure. So I wonder if, if this chat room where those left-wing people and uh, right-wing people who are hacking, <coughs> who are hacking to kill you and hacking to save you, if, do you really feel like that was, I mean, it's interesting, of course, to see those conversations, but I feel, I feel less and less optimistic about that as a space of dialogue. How, how did you feel about it? Uh, to me, it's just like, I'm not strange to <coughs> that. I grew up with no TV. Yeah. So there, the internet came when I was really late um, in, in my theories, maybe. Um, to be honest, I, I thought it was really important to go back and look at 3,000 pages of uncensored dialogue. And I think anonymity, it was the key word. People were doing and saying things they have because there is, there is no, very much, they thought nobody knew who they, they were, right? There is, um, uh, nothing could um, affect or impose on them because of the action and the war, the war they were doing. And it was fascinating to watch. Um, a lot of them did not know I was recording every IP address they ever come from. And I remember one of these days, just like day 10, when <laughs> so many people were shooting at me and I had no idea what is happening. And I talked to Jason who helped me all the time and I said, okay, another group of people attack. He said, well, let me see. And this is like this, the beauty of, of, of technology and the connectivity. Um, he went on, took two minutes and came back and he said, well, we have a big problem. And I said, what is the problem? And he said, um, a very advanced hackers in Texas turned every idle computer in the entire Texas into a shooter. An idle computer, this computer is idle now, I'm not using it. So that computer is a shooter. And I said, how are you going to fix it? And he said, just give me 10 minutes. True. Ten minutes later, and it was all of a sudden silent. And I said, Jason, what did you do? He said, I banned the entire state of Texas. Every medium that it can be ever <coughs> invented is going to be co-opted at some point. We use it until the next platform is available. All right, I think Frank wants us to be out of the room. Thank you so much again. <laughs> um, we're, we're not quite ready to leave. Oh, um, uh, but uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. And I think uh, 
a very fitting presentation as a keynote for a, a, a symposium on dramaturgy and performance with many, many references to the kind of structural problems that we face in making out of our complex situations and actually highly performative. So thank you very much. It was, uh, it was wonderful, wonderful work. And uh, we'll continue that conversation when we break for the reception downstairs. Um, but before we do that, there is um, uh, a, a, a very serious... It's downstairs. Oh, apologies. Okay. On the third floor. Okay. So um, we, we do have a colleague who, who passed away <laughs> in the summer, and we uh, I won't introduce it now. We'll go downstairs, and we're going to have a little um, uh, a memorial for that person, and we're going to have a reading and <coughs> So, if we a reception all, followed by a reception. Uh, it's a bit like a, you know, a wake, I guess, but which is a very, very happy thing in our culture. So, um, uh, but if we could go down to those of us who are joining us, go down to the third floor, um, room three zero 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 one, which is, uh, I mean, I'm sure we'll have many people to guide you down there. But if you get lost, it's quite complicated. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you need to look for the green room for the theatre program. So, uh, 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 but if you come down with us, we'll, we'll make sure you're